Greetings and salutations, travelers. Welcome back to the Inn of Planar Crossroads. And as always, welcome back to our Around the Hearth discussion. We are going through our discussion this time of running town guards effectively. So we'll be touching into that momentarily. First, we need to get through our announcements. Always less than five minutes for me. You can time me. Here we go. Uh, for the this is coming out in August, so like I announced last time, you should be seeing the revamped at least holder page, a uh, placeholder page for our web page because I'm having to kind of wait on our web designers after they had some hiccups in their staffing to be able to handle that for us. So there should at least be up the a page holder, placeholder page, I should say. Um, and we should be getting fairly close to our 1,000 subs by the end, but this is coming out in like the th third week of August, I think. So it should be, oh wait, no, this isn't coming out in August. I, we well, you know it's that whole thing. This is not August because the collaboration stuff's coming out in August. So I'm ah. not doubling up. <laughs> I'm not doubling up the Around the Hearths. So this is actually coming out in it's September. Wow. We are recording so far out. I am set. This is Woo! good stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, nice. uh, so this is actually September. Oops. For last time. Um, Happy fall. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm failing up. There we go. <laughs> uh, the Anyway, we should pretty, be pretty close, if not at our thousand subs, at which time mm -hmm. we will be getting our giveaway ready and our uh we're gonna do a one shot dice giveaway mm. for a dice set and a metal dice that i got and also uh, oh the printable pdf those are four things i know we're going to be doing and we may add or take away we may add we won't take away uh, a few things in there if it works out uh, depending on how internet is and things like that will depend on if we do any additional one-shot giveaways or anything because of mm. just logistical portions on my end but that's what i've got so dan hello i'm dan from avenue studios and i am super excited to see that 1000 mark hit for adam uh because I was there when he purchased perhaps some of those giveaways. So well worth it. I'm excited. But for us at Avenue Studios, you can find us on YouTube, Rumble, anywhere podcasts are found. We do uh, actual plays and a little bit informative. Um, the biggest thing for us is we are now uh, doing live streaming on YouTube. Um, as you can see, if you've been watching the Around the Hearts, you've been slowly seeing the transformation behind me. So this is our live streaming studio setup. And uh, as of September, in July, uh, pre-recording this, or during the time that we're recording this, we're shooting our uh, live stream of the Pathfinder 2E Beginner Box. So that's kind of our foyer, foyer into live streaming. Uh, Jacob, who ran away like the town guards, <laughs> um, <laughs> is running that. And uh, it's it's going to be great. And so we'll be doing lots of live stream actual play. You can, if you join our Patreon or our locals community, uh, we'll be live streaming our patron games that we do once a month as well. Um, so you can support us there. And uh, I think, I'll throw this out to Adam. He doesn't know I'm going to say this too. Once Adam's up on locals, maybe we should do something collaboration- locals thing because yeah. then we can connect our communities that would be fun oh but anyways i'm new to locals so i don't know anything about that so yeah, yeah. <laughs> i didn't say i knew a lot i'm just oh. there <laughs> <laughs> which he was like hey i want to try it you got however yeah. that works you bet you better be able to cash them checks you're right in avenue studios over there i'm just saying yeah i you know <laughs> We're trying to do something. I don't know what it is, but we're doing it. <laughs> anyway, we're doing. We don't know what we're doing, but we're doing it. <clears throat> yep. Ah, <laughs> uh, anyway, the slogan that's... of YouTube. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah, that's us. All right. That means we are to Levi.
for our spotlight. I will be spotlighting the YouTube channel JFace Games. Mm. They are working on an indie TTRPG discussing different parts of building that RPG. Uh, a really interesting series is borrowing. I guess, okay, building an RPG is the broader thing. The borrowing sub series, you might call it. Yeah. Uh, looks at interesting mechanics from other like board games, TTRPGs, whatever might be relevant, and looks at interesting pieces of that as inspiration, where there are also broader discussions of building an RPG. Um, I think it's just, even if you don't want to like full-on build an RPG, I think looking at these and hearing these concepts are also helpful for if you want to add individual house rules into your games to change the feel to more how you want that specific game to run. Mm. Mm -hmm. nice. uh, what was the channel Interesting again? con- J-Face Games. Yeah. Face? I've got it up for people. Oh, like, J-Face, uh, literally, all one word. Okay. Like, J-Face, if you wanted to pronounce it awkwardly, because there's not a vowel in between. J-Face. Even better. <laughs> J-Face. 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 How much it is Italian? Sweet. All right. Um, uh, well, well. Solid audio, link. clear visuals. Mm -hmm. And he presents it in a way that is. Uh, he doesn't dive in huge, big, long expositions about the sips, the the systems he looks at. He's like, this is what I like, and I think I'll I'll try to incorporate some version of it in my deal and he tells you why yeah. he likes it. A lot of the borrowing videos are like 10 minutes-ish long. Mm. 8, 9, 10. So mm. like long enough to be like, hey, base understanding, mechanic I like, how I would use it in an RPG other than this one. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. So yeah. Alright. And that means we are done with our shout-out, I guess. Hmm? So now, travelers, have a seat by the fire or by the cool hearth. Pull your shoes off and set them on the chilled stone while we grab our preferred beverages and discuss town guards and how to run them effectively. All right. Now, technically, it was Jacob who said yeah. he wanted to do this one. But since he's not here, his home channel has to take up the slack. Oh, surprise, oh. assault. Oh, man. Town guards. I was having a dad joke moment of like, Jake wanted to talk about running town guards, and then he just ran away. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> no, he's got animals to tend to. <clears throat> and a game to run at 3 a.m. Also <laughs> true. <laughs> Check out the video about online tabletop gaming, and you'll hear all about that. Yeah. Um, town guards are always fun. Mm. You have to have some. We were making the arrow to the knee joke earlier. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be a blooper for there. Um, I, I think this is just me spitballing, too. <laughs> if you check out my Bomb Squad campaign on our channel... I had a lot of discussion about town guards with one of the characters, uh, hmm. one of the players, Austin, who plays our hero, because he had assumptions about the town guards because we went to his town. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, so it is a tricky thing. Um, and get, you guys, I'm going to spit this out and you guys take it where you want to go with it, of um, setting expectations with it a little bit. I never thought about that. Because I may have more of a uh, kind of video game perspective on the town guard. It's just like, it's an NPC. They're clearly not going to have... To me, it was obvious that they're clearly not going to have PC stats. We were playing an open legend, which is more of a heroic narrative-based game system, generally speaking. Mm. Um, so that also affected the flavor. It's like, I can't have everybody being able to throw out PC level 
Mm-hmm. Uh, at least that was my assumption. So um, maybe this is a good conversation starting point of what, what, where have you guys run into that, or how do you, how have you handled that, or think other people should with that. My base assumption had been they're town guards. They're you know they're not going to be as powerful as your player characters or your big big er baddies. Hmm. Um, but Austin, you know, this is a world I'm building my world with my players. So he had invested in this world. He's like, well, they're the cloud dragon. They're well-trained and fair enough. But I'm like, but they're not you. And you're, <laughs> they're not the arc hero. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that was kind of, I, I that caught me off guard. Hmm. LOL. <laughs> no yeah. pun intended. No, 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 no. All puns intended. <laughs> All puns intended. Pun newly intended. Yeah. Yes. Duly. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm curious where where if you guys experience something like that or how you think that should be. And we talked about it. Uh, you know, we kind of connected in communication. You know, I mean, check out. I think we've talked about this in our session zero around the hearth of communication and always keeping that up. So, and of course, Austin and I are good friends. So it wasn't like game breaking or party breaking or anything. But it was just like, oh. I didn't, I didn't think about this perspective and setting those expectations for my players, um, and what what exactly is the right right thing? And it may be it's probably game by game, table to by table, hmm. sort of thing. But I'm curious what uh, Adam and Levi, what you guys have to say about that. Well, as you were saying, gut reaction is game by game, table to table. Yeah, um, I should say that. One of the things I have often done is because a lot of times I am also preferring a more heroic story when I'm running something. Mm. However, there's a difference between like, yeah, you are stronger than any individual guard and you are stronger than the 20 town guards who are after you right now because you obviously just blew up that building. (laughs) (laughs) Like one fireball. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. One fireball, like in a city, is is crazy. Yeah, I mean, like that's gonna draw people. Yeah. <laughs> um, now this is really this concept right here is decently system dependent, and how close you make your guards to your players. Because hmm. uh, if you're like playing in Pathfinder Second Edition base normal rules, and they're like level ten, and the guards are like the equivalent of level one. You mm-hmm. could throw twenty. It's it's just, <laughs> I'm by the rules of the game, they are literally not worth counting for XP. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean that that's very true in in Pathfinder Two E, Pathfinder One E, not quite as much, but Pathfinder Two E the 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 and I guess this goes for whichever system you're in. The larger mm-hmm. the disparity between levels, the larger the disparity of power between your players. And the average person, and in this case, the average guard. Yeah, um, and I think even within the same game, I like drastically altering the powers of, like how strong guards are, based off of how, I guess, important, scary, whatever I want to make this city, mm. right? The more resources and otherwise need a city has for guards, the stronger of guards they can have as, like, their baseline. Mm. Right? If we're talking, hey, this is, like, a pretty small, relatively peaceful town. They've got, like, yeah, we got, like, a a couple level one people who run around at night to make sure nothing really weird happens. But also, if you've got, as you were talking, the Drake guard, maybe there are other normal guards who are just like yeah we kind of bounce at pubs a little bit whatever in their level one Mm. otherwise like let's say weaker than your average player we can use that framing to be a little more system agnostic Mm. but maybe you want like hey these are like royal guards you can't mess with like the district around like the capital or the kingdom or whatever specific thing you want and you could have those guards stronger than the players currently are yeah i think guards are a useful way for setting the like 
power and threat level of a current location. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Right? Because if you come across guards and, like, they've got some clubs on their hip and, like, they're maybe wearing, like, a, a little bit of chain mail and then you go to another place and they're in full plate with, like, flaming halberds. Yeah. Um, right? You, you're gonna know mm -hmm. some things about the area you're in. Because in many mm. ways, while each individual guard is an NPC, we're discussing guards, they're, you could honestly more consider them part of the setting until they start interacting with any individual one of them. Hmm. So yeah. I think they're useful for yeah. like signposting and helping them understand the locale they are in. Mm -hmm. Signaling to your players through the world building. Yeah. yeah, like, actually, you can go, like, for world building, a classic thing of, like, oh, this is not a town you want to be in, is, like, the sneering or cruel guards. Mm -hmm. Right? While they are also NPCs, until we're, like, going into more direct interactions with them, you can do the quick thing of, like, like, as you walk into this place, you see someone, like, trip and fall with their cabbages in front of a guard and get hit. <laughs> Smacked back. Cabbages as an avatar reference, obviously. Um, <laughs> My cabbages! Gotta have the cabbage dealer. <laughs> um, but the, the core point is that, like, as a very quick interaction of just, like, hey, someone, like, tripped some, bumped into a guard, and then got shoved to the ground is, like, a quick way to, if no one responds weirdly to that, it's a quick way to show, hey... This is a bit of a rough and tumble place. Don't mess with mm. the guards unless you really want to mess with the guards. Mm. It, it it signals a lot of information in just one single action. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, well, there's yes. obviously some sort of corruption within the force yeah. if they're abusing the citizenry anyway. So. And if you want to show, like, uh, a pretty <laughs> happy place, you have the person fall with their cabbages and a couple guards come over and help them pick up their stuff. Yeah, right. Like, you can vary either direction, however you want to signal this specific locale. Like, guards are a large, effective part of the setting to world build. Yeah. And no, I, that's great. That's a show-don't-tell sort of thing, even though you're talking to describe it. But well, the packing a lot into one moment, that's really good. And we have to remember, when you're when you're doing this in medieval times, guards are not the same as police. Mm. They're, they're not quite the same. I mean, one led into the other, but they don't necessarily serve the people. They serve either the city or whoever's hired them to be a guard. And you don't, just because they're, they are a guard doesn't mean they're a guard of the city. They may just be a guard of that establishment or a guard of this because that was very common nobles would have their own guards around their place or around their mm. establishments so private we would call them private military forces but that's not really what they were then they were just what you had as guards and, well mm -hmm. it, it would be fair to say that private military was just the norm back then yeah, and they weren't even necessarily considered a military. They were just... That's fair. Private guards. security. Yeah, private security. There you mm -hmm. go. Private security is mm -hmm. better. And so you can look at it like these are all different security. They aren't... There's no, like, oath saying that they're going to uplift the people, you know, hold these rights to be self-evident and true because they didn't have that back then. Usually when you're dealing in the, in the medieval setting, you're pre-Magna Carta, which means you are not presumed innocent until proven guilty. Like if people are suspicious of you, you go to jail first, usually, and then they figure out if you are innocent or guilty type of thing. And from a modern perspective, people don't like to, to necessarily have that happen to their characters, but it's part of the buy-in of the setting too. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. as far Which as... actually brings us up, maybe you want to specify that aspect of the law to your players hmm. just because it goes against their intuitions it can be useful uh if you have players that are not used to taking themselves taking away what they're assuming and 
and then dumping their mind into the setting alone, like separating those two things, then it can be, and I mean, even if you're used to that, even as a GM, you have to take away your assumptions of what the outside normal world is for you and say, well, what's normal for this world? What's normal yeah. for here? And so, and, and that can feed back into what we were talking about with the guards and their power levels. Uh, mm. It's one of those things where the bigger the city, they probably have a better budget for better guards. That doesn't mean they'll have a lot of better guards, but, but most likely they're more powerful or trusted guards will actually be ex-adventurers or something along that line that have got a mm. steady gig. They were adventuring for the money and they got a steady gig. And I mean, even if like they, maybe they wanted to settle down and have a family, an adventurer who retires does not automatically lose levels. So if you've, you've got a, a, a level five adventurer that did well for himself and gets offered the, a high position in the city guard and doesn't have to do a lot in it, in a, in a moderate to larger city, he might just take that up or he gets offered to the sheriff shire reef position that's yep. that's steady income safety you just got to yeah. deal with certain things also a good way to retire a character who fulfilled their revenge yeah mm. yeah those like characters. this dragon this dragon burnt down my town me and my party killed that dragon i'm mm. good um. <laughs> Yeah, not only that, they've got the dragon horde, if there was any. If it was like a young dragon, it might have been building up its horde. It might have had yeah. money from that to rebuild the town and start in. And that's where you have either... You could have both sides of the dark or the light of the, of the guards there. Maybe those characters came back and said, We saved the town. This is our town now. Type of thing. Or, we save the town, let's build it back better, and use the Horde to do it that way. And you could have both sides. You, with those type of situations, you you can have those very powerful guards, because they killed a dragon. Like, they went on a big adventure and killed a dragon, came back level 3 to 5. For a, for a setting that is normal... We'll use those in air quotes for Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and such like that. A level five PC that retires and becomes an NPC is outright broken compared to the rest of anybody. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, I mean, a level five wizard would wreck an entire town. If 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 a wizard cut loose, they would wreck an entire town. Even a fighter who's stuck at melee range. Or a barbarian, or especially a barbarian, stuck at melee range, they wouldn't care. They could wreck an entire force of people. And villagers, and this is something that's not necessarily thought about, if you keep the video game mechanic in your mind instead of a real world mechanic, mm -hmm. people surrender. They don't mm. fight to the death. Like, mm -hmm. these, <laughs> the reason that you're average villager is not adventuring is because they value their life they they, <laughs> they don't want to die that's that's the big risk that you're going into you know risk reward yeah. that's why adventurers have reward is that they get they risk it and then they get it or they die and guards that have gone through that they may not want to die like if they're a fresh guard they don't want to die. They're level. They're a level one character at most if they've gone through training. So mm -hmm. if they've gone through training. They're a level one character. If they've sure. gone through no, if they're just the local militia, they may they may have a little bit. They may be like half a character, half a PC. That'd be fair. Mm -hmm. At least I'm thinking from open open legend perspective. Half the character. Right. Points. You could do like a companion mm -hmm. level type, and then. That's a good scale. You can do that. I I love... I think one of the major points we're hitting that <clears throat> I think I assumed and didn't think about, it's back to Levi's original thing, was the town guards as a whole is part of the campaign and a setting. It's a flavor because all of this 
these decisions that you make about how you're setting that up, whether it's setting whole or, you know, location specific, the, how you're handling the guards is going to send a lot of signals to the players and tell them something about the world, especially if they're paying attention. Um, because what I'm thinking too, is when you guys are talking about cities that have more larger, uh, places like cities that have the money to put into their guards, um, maybe the guards are all level one or they're lower than level one, but they have equipment that's way beyond their capacity, like the fire halberd or, you know, play armor. Yeah. So they are doing really well, but then the players could start to realize with, <laughs> they don't these guys have stuff that makes them we should have you know or is beyond what their real ability is and it's just because the city can throw money at it hmm. so and then going back to the um sorry go ahead adam i don't want to so lower level a, a way to balance that is to say okay they're yeah. a low level character but they have better gear because gear is right. gear's not always king in every setting but gear makes mm -hmm. a big difference in your bonuses so right and even in low magic settings, having a arming sword was different than having just a sword sword short sword. Right. Yeah. So, I mean that extra distance. Usually, if you're playing a low magic, you're playing a more gritty type of system anyway, and you'll have that gradient of difference in your weapons. Those make a big difference. Or if you're in a low magic setting, and those guards in the bigger cities, they've got plus one weapons. Well, that's a big deal in a low magic setting. That mm -hmm. plus one makes a huge difference, even for a, a level, especially for a level one character that drastically increases your chance to hit. So mm -hmm. you you can change up and, and mix around the difficulty levels. Just be aware that if you do that, whatever the guard has, they can be the players. Can be the players. Can be. So yep. Don't give them a, a, a plus five verbal blade. Uh, unless you're willing to Unless it's cursed. It. Hello, unless it's cursed. <laughs> cursed is always a good option. <laughs> yes. Okay, so this, this brings up something I also wanted to say. Because I have had, especially going back to like high school days, some groups where people would just, for the funsies of it, they got bored with the other interactions and decided they were going to start a fight with town guards. Something I recommend... <laughs> <laughs> is separate to any individual town guard have a backstory with like things from like a family and mm. residents and like preferably the less mature the group the more in your face you've got to be about it so uh <laughs> if we want to go the the sick kid route is a pretty good one here mm. and yeah. not uncommon like single parent <laughs> yeah like, single parent right. with a sick kid who is, like, spending all of their resources to keep them afloat. Yeah. Because this sort of player is going to be scrounging for loot. Right. Right. So you're going to then tell them that, like, they're going to have, like, a, a little record book of all of their debts for all of the medicine for their child. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh. you're going to throw it in their face that they have now just also killed a kid. Right. Yeah. Unless they then become the guardian. Yeah. It like it could be a oh, right. man side quest. I I'm just... just saying, like, if you if you have players who you think might just like Skyrim video game mindset, you know what? I've played Skyrim. I never once felt bad killing any of the town guards when they got annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and when gotta... playing Skyrim, I didn't yeah, feel it's... bad. Yeah, well, right, this is just pixels. Make them feel bad in the TTRPG. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and you can do that. Have the pain ready, because they are characters. They're they're right. they're non-player characters, which means they are characters. They're not just mm -hmm. they're not just generic guard that looks the same under the armor type of thing from Fallout 4 or <laughs> Skyrim yeah, right. or something like that. Right. Like yeah, Morrowind. Yeah. Go back farther. <laughs> they, they've they got, well, after by the time you go back to Morrowind, almost everybody looks the same. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got this misunderstanding with because of modern video games that these mm -hmm. guards are just 
other bits of the world to interact in like uh, they're just a forest or they're just a road or they're just a building no right. they're part of the world building like levi was saying that is mm -hmm. actually alive actually doing things changing and having that backstory is good and i think as far as dealing with that in an organic way to deal with the power level the we mentioned that a a larger city is going to have more money to throw at stuff so they'll probably have better captains of the guard and they'll probably have better equipment for their guards but their guards may be relatively the same as in the surrounding area of we'd call it suburbia but they wouldn't so the surrounding mm -hmm. suburban relatively safe areas that didn't deal with a lot of um raiding or stuff like that i think that amusingly guards... the suburbia would kind of be central because the farther out you go the more likely you are to get raided right and and that's kind of where i'm leading because you'd have this mm. this moderate normal level of guard in suburbia area that that place in between that kind of goldilocks zone where everybody's still looking out for each other in the community but it's not so big where they throw a bunch of money at stuff and you know, there can be a lot of corruption and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. if you go out into the wilds, or you go out to the fringes of where law and order are, those guards would actually... Those, those individual guards, not the guards as a whole, but the individual guards, those individual guards would probably be more... more threatening to the party than if they weren't than if they were just another guard in another town because those fringes they deal with the bandits if you're a guard and the in, bears yeah it, bandits mm. bears wild boars you know were beasts if there's were beasts they I have was to gonna deal with say those. Were beasts, yeah mm -hmm. so they have legitimate reason to be strong they are a stationary adventurer especially if there's only a few of them so if there's yep. a, if the town has enough size to be organized and have somebody like a Shire Reef that they may have appointed themselves because they couldn't get one from the lord of the of the area. So they just made their own Shire Reef and he protects him and a few right. others protect. Those dudes would be those dudes could pose an actual threat to the party. And because a lot of parties spend time outside of the safe areas you could actually say, this town guard is not taking any of your stuff today. He said you need to mm -hmm. pay your toll to get into town, or you mm -hmm. do not get into town. You do not enter the city gates until you get paid the toll. Because they had, that was a legitimate thing. You don't pay, don't pay until you get in. I mean, you don't get in until you pay. Those type of taxes right. were real. So, yeah you literally can't well you could you could force your way in but then everybody's going to scatter and no one's going to serve you right it's better just to pay the silver to get in than it is to try and possibly lose one of your players to this very beefy probably rough and tumble guard out on the fringes mm -hmm. with some bad with some bad with some bad yeah right I mean, it really all goes back to the initial point Levi was making, but like that also helps deter if you're doing that suburbia versus city thing too. You go to the city, you might be able to talk your way or bribe your way in too because of that. Like they don't really care as much. It's like, yeah. eh. if they've got traders going in and out all day, your little right. one silver is not going to make a, your little one silver party is not going to make a difference. And that could be a fun thing to play with, too. Both, again, that show, not tell sort of thing of, like, if they're maybe used to the corruption and being able to talk their way in or sneak their way in or bribe their way in, and then you go to one of these places that you're that Adam's describing, um, that would be a shock. And it's like, this place is different. You're different. That we now have an entirely, in one interaction where this guard just doesn't take any BS and is just like, no, and can actually back it up with his stats. 
Yeah. That would be very interesting because now the players who have had this assumption, that assumption's broken in a good way and it now defines the whole that whole area for them and maybe how they approach things well, for good or ill. <laughs> yeah, because for them, they have a vested interest on the fringes and even a bit in suburbia. They have a legitimate personal attachment to keeping the town safe. They live right. here. Their family lives here. Their friends live here. In a big city, I mean, they live down that neighborhood or they live up that street. But mm -hmm. as far as the city city, eh, maybe. Right. And on the on the flip side, in essence, too, going back to your point, Adam, about sometimes people run away. If you're in something more like the city where it's just a paycheck relatively for this guard. And uh, was it Levi mentioning the idea of the, the sick kid, too? That guard might not fight, probably won't fight to the death and be like, look, just take take my fire halberd. You know, I've got this, you know, I've kid, got a kid I, that I need it. He's, I need this job or even better if they're like they defeat him and he surrenders but he's like please don't take anything I can't lose this job there's so many story options side quests possible things you can do with that mm -hmm. yeah it there's definitely a lot of room because it is an assumed relatively large batch of characters mm. that you can like pull stories into yeah and i'm even thinking too that could define your campaign even at that level or or even just a one shot if you have a guard surrender what that player chooses to do if the player is still in that mindset of you're just a guard kill yeah. and then you have the consequences unfold from that 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 can yeah, define there... the whole that can shift things yeah, were there witnesses? Is there now a bounty out for the for the murderer of a town guard who's left an orphan son behind? A sickly Narrate orphan their son. funeral. Yep. Ooh, nice. I've done that. Like I was playing with a <laughs> relatively young, like girlfriend, her younger brother. It was like some of the first TTRPG experience he had had. And he was just like, ooh, I'm a strong guy with a sword. I'm going to run up and slash him. Yeah. And I'm like, eh, this is a bad lesson. Here, here we go. I'm going to narrate yeah. this person's funeral. One of their kids died because they couldn't get the medicine to him. The other two nice. were sickly, and now the wife's alone. Like, they buried him out in their own yard. You still have to go and get the, like, medicine to the rest of their family so not all three kids die, but... Yeah. <laughs> like, he... He still talks about that story like five years later. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's like, why we do this. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I, you'd be, for someone who is just doing it out of like honest ignorance to how the sort of medium should go, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It is the sort of thing that can like very quickly give a semi permanent lesson of like, oh, oh, there's a full narrative here. There are people here. I can't just swing my sword at everyone and it'd be okay mm -hmm. and this is why i'm like hey just like have a sad plot line ready <laughs> whatever guard Keep they a kill sap story in your back pocket <laughs> if they Levi's kill a guard line. <laughs> well but the thing is right yeah. all you have to do is change a, a name or two here or there if you have it written out and ready right mm -hmm. i was it thinking be attached to any guard yeah, I was thinking about, for those who like tables, I kind of like those sometimes. You can have a little table of just, like, ten basic stories. Roll a d10 that's... when it happens. Let's see what, Ooh, it, that's what true. was up going on. You know, it could be that yeah. simple. That would, that'd be really easy to have, like, hey, uh, what are my ten narratives relating to a guard? They have a sick kid. Uh, they're a money launderer. <laughs> Like, As someone who plays Open Legend a lot, you know, maybe make it a D12. Make it 12 just so the D12 has something to do. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but for, for real, that's... Uh, I always like that, even if it's just an inspiration, too. Let's like, okay, well, let's... I've got these 12 basic inspirational things, or, you know, 
however yeah. however deep into the um spreadsheets you like to go <laughs> yeah uh if we want to use interesting spreadsheet method we could do a d1212 Ooh. Wow. so how that works is you roll 2d12 and it is a grid okay because i've seen this for a d66 in some things and okay. it would be like a 36 piece grid and it's one through six on one axis and one through six on the other then you yep. have to populate 144 things yeah but if you're really in if you really like tables some people like generating tables for the sake of it that's right or fair. what you could do in for a d1212 that's more reasonable is have like on this one it's like family situation on this one second plot line and it like intrinsically builds out 144 you just don't have them listed yeah yeah sure right like single parent who is about to get a promotion or something like that right it could one be... day away from retirement uh... <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh it's right. so good <laughs> But like you, you could pair like one day away from retirement with has been embezzling money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice, oh, I love it. That could lead to a whole quest line right there. Yep. So find, I, find his black book and depends on how intense you want to get. Uh, I do recommend right, yeah. just the one table because <laughs> unless like guards are like extremely like if your players really latch onto we want to interact with these guards, maybe you want more options. But I well, think for the normal amount like a, a d12 table yeah will give playing, you plenty of inspiration if you're playing a city hunter a city campaign or like a bounty hunter campaign where you're interacting mm. with reward you know guards or the shire reef and the guard are usually uh the re reward givers for those type of bounty hunter type things or the right if you're playing in a in a well, city and... you will be interacting oh, with God. the guards so right and I was going to say to go, what would it be, setting agnostic to this applies to a police force or a bounty hunter, you know, table. Actually, bounty hunter versus police force is always an interesting dynamic to play with. Makes me always think of, um, oh my gosh, what's the anime? Uh, Cowboy Bebop. Oh yeah. Thank you. Cowboy I was gonna make Bebop. him think it. I was gonna make him mull it over. <laughs> yeah, we are on little time. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> Levi's like, yeah. Thank you, Levi. Cowboy Bebop. You know that whole sort of thing. That 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 does kind of encapsulate it a little bit. The mm. the bounty hunter versus police force, and that's that same kind of vibe that you could build in. All, all these same things apply of the police force determining the setting, giving you a lot of story information very fast or setting information very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and if specifically referencing in Cowboy Bebop, look at Jet's backstory and all of his stuff in his episodes. Yes. And you can see a good yep. refre reflection of that type of thing. Yep. All right. I wanted to make one final point before we get, you know, timed out. Um, the get it, Captain idea of figuring out what type of training if you don't want to in to do just equipment you can say that okay their training has been revolving around teamwork feats so that you make mm. them more powerful as a group than as individuals which is something like you see with kobolds you can see it with those smaller races that yep. doesn't have to be limited to the smaller races uh treat it like take a wolf pack and look at that and see the ideas of pack tactics and stuff look at those options yeah. when you're looking at your town guards because that's really how the training would be they they yep. don't want to fight you on one-on-one -on -one. their power is in numbers and they know it yeah i yeah, also think really that would good. be interesting to give uh, larger area cops more non-lethal techniques because they have the time to train to actually be able to enact those. Mm. For modern police, yeah. Well, I mean, even for, like, like in a city with, like, uh, less city, more, like, ruled over by someone, if they want to have, like, public executions for people. Mm. What? Right? They need some ways to, like, retain the people so that way they can do their larger shows of force later. Well... I mean, back in that time, they could just kill you and hang you up at the city gates, so... Yeah, but there's not as much spectacle. It is true. 
like public executions were a thing for reasons. Yeah. I don't like the reasons per se, but they they had reasons. And mm -hmm. I mean, they did they did public displays of gore for for effect. Like if you look in the scripture, Saul was Saul killed himself on the battlefield so he wouldn't be captured. Mm. They then chopped his body up and put it chopped his head off and put it on a display. So the so they had to go to a raiding party to go get his head and put it with his body and stuff like that. But that's shame's that. a big thing. Shame's a yeah. big thing. Yeah. All right. Final remarks, people. Final remarks. I'll start. Uh one, of course, let us know how you've use town guards in the comments below i think the biggest takeaway from all of this and it's i thank you guys for this conversation too is that town guards in whatever fashion are a part of the setting they're a part of the world they are a tool as a gm to tell your players about the world and they can either lead to stories they can describe the setting they are so versatile they're they're an integral part Oh, you cut out. They're an integral part. And then it cut. I don't know how they're having. Can you hear? Oh, they're an integral yes. part of your storytelling tools. There you go. <laughs> Anyways, um, and also side note, I just was thinking about Attack on Titan with the three different factions, and it would make a great campaign idea. Oh, locked inside a city type thing? Yeah, I mean, you have the scouts, you have the the wall guards, and I can't remember the third one in this this moment. But, anyways, All there's right. there's so much that guards can do to add to stories. All right, Levi, any final oh. remarks? Um, a side thought I had while we were discussing is that playing as a town guard could be a really interesting solo campaign. Mm hmm. You could do solo or like a small group, two or three people. Yeah, small groups, uh, you're going to have to do a lot more weird time skip things, I feel. Or at the very least, make sure that they're very astringently, you are this unit. Oh, if you, yeah, if you're doing like a, a modern campaign, you can say you you you're the, you guys are the night shift. Or, you know, mm, ooh, yeah. cool. and well, then like, you can do some supernatural stuff. Ooh, oh, that'd be fun. yeah. That'd be fun. Well, and I was thinking that would match with my Attack on Titan idea, too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. This is your this is the group you're assigned to. Yeah. I like that a lot. Well done. But even just a normal mundane guard, I think, could make a real solid solo TTRPG. It's like, hey, you're out this day. Like, this is your beat. Here are the things you see on like this whatever. And then you nice. can see then corruption in other parts of the force or mm -hmm. there's like a captain who's not corrupt, he's just bad at his job. <laughs> Yep. Very film noir, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Just. Well, you were talking about adventurers who are locked in, and I'm like, okay. Why not have something as an adventurer who is locked into the area and play that out? See how that works. Yeah, I like it. And I mean, if adventurers end up going into the fringes and building up their own thing in like a West March or a Kingmaker type of setup. They become the town guard, basically. I yeah. mean, they can't hire right. anybody else. It's their town. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our... Good way to when same same campaign or same players, new campaign. You get to see your old characters if you're in the same setting. Yeah. Yeah. And you know not to mess with your own characters then. <laughs> you're like, right. oh man, oh man. I'm gonna keep. I've heard butt. of this guy. <laughs> It's like, I ended that campaign at level 10. Dude. We're level 2. <laughs> uh, they could wipe the floor with us. I love it. Alright. We're getting the warning, so time to sign off. Thank you guys for watching, and as always, have a great day. God bless, and enjoy. Bye. This content was made possible by travelers and viewers like you. Thank you. There you are. Whoa, so sorry. <laughs> no worries.
You said you were sudden... using companion mode for a second, and I'm like, what's companion yeah. mode? I have no idea. I don't know what was going on. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> no worries. And then at first I went to start, and then half the half my camera went gray, and the other half went like green and purple, and so oh. I had to just close everything. <laughs> yeah. Did you try turning it off and turning it back on again? Yep, basically. That's what you did. Oh. Uh, anyway, sorry about that. I am here. Oh. Greetings. Greetings. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> and salutations. He's oh. threats with ya. Kegzilla. My drug. Drug. <laughs> Moya drug. Moy drug. I don't actually know. I only know Droog, Droog because of other people. So Droog is like bro brother, no, bro. But more bro. like friend. Friend, yeah. Like truly brother is brat. Brat, I yeah. think it's the M-O-N, if you will, with the little... Moy. Moy. Moy, Moy. The, the more Y with the I. Moy. Yep. I believe that's what you would do for Droog. But I'm not positive. Because I'm very much a beginner. <laughs> Droog! 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 Instead of saying dude, you're like, Droog! Droog! <laughs> I like that. What's up, Droog? <laughs> uh, that's the thing with language, too, is like, I want to know how to say, like, hey, what's up? But you can't just literally translate what's up. <laughs> you gotta figure They'd out. They'd be like, like uh, I don't know mean? what is up. What do you mean, what is up? The, yes. the sky, because then they would actually say, "Well, the sky is up." I mean, <laughs> what do you mean? So oh, I love it. <laughs> Anyways, colloquialisms. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Those silly also Americans the... and their colloquialisms. <laughs> yeah. Not only do we use the silly language of English, we also make it even more difficult. <laughs> well, in some ways, I think English is the best language you have in the modern setting right now but yeah in sure. other ways it is also the worst language that you have in the modern <laughs> setting right now it's a silly silly language <laughs> yeah especially when you start teaching your kid and you realize i don't know what to tell you man this is how you do it for this word and there's no real reason other than that's how we do it <laughs> well there's no real reason that we have access to now because mm -hmm. it came from a lot of other rules from a lot of other things that yeah. isn't consistent because it wasn't consistent right. and this is specifically the version that was formalized by the people with the money to formalize it yeah. that's why I didn't I, uh, I told my kids about I before E except after C but I told them also it is, an it is not a law it is not a don't They're don't more trust like it. Guidelines and actual rules. Yeah. <laughs> so, There's apparently no. a longer phrase, except when sounded as a as a neighbor in way. Yes, that's what I learned. Yep. Yeah, but that's. I mean, it's English, so. <laughs> no, for sure. I just I didn't learn that full thing. I just only heard about it when I was older. Oh, yeah. that's funny. Yeah, I never learned uh... the full thing. And even so, I would have been like, well, now I'm pronouncing each word that has it over and over again. Why not just memorize how to spell the word? Which is what you're doing anyway. That's all spelling is, is memorization. Yeah, yeah. Right. Even if you... Because I know phonics. The, the, the best thing for me when I was a kid to teach me to speak well was to learn syllables and the basics of phonics. Because if you know syllables and the basics of phonics, you can decipher most English words. Mm -hmm. You have to be like, all right, there's like a, this little specific part has a couple ways it could be pronounced. Based yep. off of the rest of it, here's my best guess. Yeah. And usually, <laughs> if you know phonics, your best guess is pretty close pretty to right. Yeah, at, probably at the worst, intelligible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You ever confuse people with the word epitome? Epitome. Uh. <laughs> Epi epitome? Ep epitome? <laughs> right? Because that was a word that I had, like, read a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And then I said it, and people were confused. 
Well, and I always well, thought Epitome had a D in it. Ah, uh, that's that's fair enough. I had a cousin that thought garbage was garbage for way too long. <laughs> and if we go into older English before the mm -hmm. locked-in state, we would have written it differently. Yeah. Right, right. Well, it's... I am not a fan of Q or K. I mean, Q or C. <laughs> but... Because yep. they're redundant. But I understand why we have them. I just don't think that they accomplish the purpose that they've set. That they've set because we have so many repeating spellings anyway. It doesn't change anything. Excess yep. yep. could just be e k e s s. Excess. If you wanted e k s e s. Right. Excess. What? Uh, so it's not very it's efficient. Become more poignant having children and trying to teach my oldest right now is. I'm just like, man, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> this is well, how you say it. When I was a teenager, just I was trying, trying to sound to... out each letter, you know, and you can't do it. Yeah. When I was a teenager, I was making up my own kind of writing system, phonic type thing in, in language. Mm. And I was like, the C, and the, Q, the C and the Q really are not important. Like, they are <laughs> uh -huh. redundant. At first, I was looking at the Dale runes and, from, from Tolkien, and I was like, well, where's the C and where's the you and mm -hmm. then i uh -huh. saw that he just used k and k s and k w and i was like that makes so <laughs> much sense uh-huh why don't we yeah. do that that is the right way to do it it's objectively right tolkien was objectively right uh -huh. yeah well and i should like there are uh like English spelling reforms that like a lot of people have went and made their own little things for. Yeah, that do things awesome. of like this to like add a consistency of pronunciation to spelling. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are certain things that that the English do that we don't do that don't make sense and do make sense. So the way they spell <laughs> color, I don't get it. Why why not have just Color, because we say <laughs> they they would be pronounced with them color, with the O U. Right. Why not just say color, because we say er 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 that O R, color, mm -hmm. color. That's how we say. It. Even they say it that way. They say color. They don't say color. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I'm like, no. <laughs> English does. American English is better than that, but. I have to give them credit. Canada and England and you know most of the rest of the world say aluminium. And if you look at it, that's more phonetically correct. And I have to admit it to them. You get that point. Aluminium. I still say aluminum. Yep. Most of the time, but Well, they actually spell it differently. Yeah, but I mean even if you look at the American spelling, it's still like yeah, there it makes more sense to be aluminium. I'm glad we say it the way we do, just because it makes the way they say it sound fun. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, if I didn't know any other difference, I wouldn't enjoy hearing aluminium. <laughs> mm. Progress I versus progress. Yes, progress. I have that with um, our playlist, AV Epics. It can also be pronounced epoch. Epic, depends on epoch. Well, but I, I like, like the to... idea of epic and epic, you know, E P I C and E P O C H, mm. and playing with that like mm. epic epics. That was the yeah. idea. Mm. I like I like to pronounce epoch as epoch and epic as epic. That makes sense. <laughs> so I've never seen epoch pronounced epic. Oh, Otherwise. really? It's funny. Yeah. All right. That's why we play with it. Well, none of this is talking about running town guards effectively. That's true. So, That's true. They we, only have, like, two lines of dialogue they repeat. <laughs> I used to be an adventurer like you. I like took an arrow to the knee. I'm not ashamed. Hey, I'm older saying. than that meme. I can oh, yeah. use it. Well, uh, pretty I've solid, played... what was that? That was Oblivion? Was that Oblivion? No, that was, Sky no, that that was, was Skyrim. Skyrim. But the thing it was is, Skyrim. I I played Skyrim when it was first. Well, not when it was first out, but when it came out in a pack. 
So, mm. I'm, I was there before the meme. I can, <laughs> I can possess that meme. The meme is mine. But <laughs> it's mine. Love it. <laughs> All right. Y'all ready to start? Yep. Let's do this. All right. Are you okay with doing that as the spotlight? Uh, yeah, Levi? seems pretty interesting. Okay. I, as to the point where I'm like, oh, I I have subscribed because I am <laughs> curious. Ooh. Yeah, he doesn't, I like it because he doesn't go too, he doesn't like dredge you through all the mechanics. He tells you, I like this and this and this from it. So Yeah. Well, and then there's also just general like building an RPG alpha testing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. <laughs> 